So, yeah, here's the the mural. Just finished it this morning. Well, can you tell us about it? Yeah, so uh, still a couple things to touch up now that the lifts are moved. We, uh, we did the whole thing on these scissor lifts that can go up 60 feet, which is really great. People ask, um, you know, uh, yeah, was this done without permission? There's no, there's no technical way really to do something on this scale without permission. But this piece is uh, about, um, really about the U.S. election and all, all, you know, all the factors around racism, ignorance, sexism, um, xenophobia that, you know, I, I think we're, we're big contributors to the election of Trump. But the entire, um, it seems like the entire Western world has been moving further to the right. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a fear of immigrants. There's a fear, a fear of Muslims. All right, and your work is obviously very political in nature and kind of one of the big topics of both, both the election and post-election has been fake news. Yeah. Uh, I think propaganda in a way can be somehow be tied into fake news. What is your definition of propaganda and how does it relate to your work and what's happening in the world now? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, propaganda has a very negative connotation, but I think um, what, I, what I try to do with my work is, is um, you know, is be very transparent. And I've used the word propaganda to describe my work as a, as a way of saying, um, don't let anyone sugarcoat it. Almost every visual you're confronted with has an agenda. So being um, analytical is what's crucial. And even though I think that my agenda is constructive and benevolent, um, understanding that my work has an agenda might also lead someone to look at the agenda of everything else. What I wanted to ask was like, if because of social media and Instagram, if like, because location is one of the biggest factors of street art and graffiti, yeah. if, like, if that still has the same effect, like your, your piece being here on this wall, it has an effect even in the Instagram age when anybody can see it and it can yeah. kind of be any city because it doesn't have the context. Well, no matter <clears throat> whether Instagram allows you to do even an obscure wall and find a big audience, my, my goal is always to find the most visible wall for the traffic of a city. Um, I can't uh, always choose the best wall, so I'd rather do a wall than no wall. So, um, you know, this is, a, I think this is actually a really, really charming spot. Um, but my hope is that because I've done some other stuff in the area, that if, uh, that's, that's more obviously visible to traffic, that anyone that knows that I've done this, if they're, you know, they're like, oh, I'm in the right zone, and, and then it becomes like a scavenger hunt, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna find it. You've been doing street art and putting your stuff out there for so long, and attitudes have changed a lot towards, towards these things. Do you think it's been positive, negative, a combination of both, as it's been absorbed by the mainstream and kind of become uh, something that everybody kind of knows about, at least loosely. Well, they're good. Yeah, they're good and, and bad factors to that. Um, the the interesting thing is that even if street art is more accepted by a lot of people, um, it's still it, it, you know it's still seen as negative to enough people to create problems. For example, in 2009, I um, I was asked by the city of Boston to do an art banner for the side of City Hall and then I did a photo shoot with the mayor and then two days later I was arrested by the Boston police for allegedly doing um, a lot of illegal work on the street. Um, and do you think, does street art and graffiti and everything you do, does it still have the same kind of sub subversive message that it might have had say 20, 30 years ago? Um, well, I I think that um, doing something that's illegal is always an act of defiance. So, um, if you you know if you if you know the Marshall McLuhan phrase, the medium is the message. It is an act of defiance that's uh, that you know that's subversive and and rebellious. But I um you know I think that it should be more than that. I think that there should be some ideas expressed, and sometimes that can be overtly political. Sometimes it can be more more implicit. But um. You know, there are a lot of people that think, oh, it's a good path to building a following for my, you know, for my fine art, and there isn't anything really provocative about it. And that's, that's okay. I think that um, art in public spaces is a good thing, but, uh, you know, I, I would like to 
see the you know the connection between um, you know activism and and street art be uh, you know something that develops further and is uh, you know it doesn't just become more of a decorative movement. We've seen some negative reactions to ads by the mainstream over the last few weeks, and things specifically of like the Kendall Jenner Pepsi fiasco. Yeah, yeah. Um, and but besides that, people seem to be more okay with advertising than ever, and they're happy to share it if they think it's well done. And then you have reactions to poor ads that then get critical acclaim because they did it properly and this kind of thing. Um, but how do you think attitudes towards ads have changed since you started spreading your work and your message? And do you think people still need to be aware that they're being manipulated and advertised to at all times? Yeah, definitely. I think that awareness about the agenda of advertising is, is always really important. And I was super happy to see that the Kendall Jenner Pepsi ad was uh, you know, pretty much universally disliked. And it's because it's disingenuous. You know, even if there was somebody there that identified with, um, you know, the Women's March and Black Lives Matter and things like that, I don't think that all ads are bad, but I think that understanding um, where ads are coming from, uh, you know, is, is important. And then, you know, appreciating the ad potentially for its artistry or, um, or some aspect of its philosophy, um, but maybe saying, I still don't think I need that product, you know, is good. You can, you know, you can hold... Uh, you know both of those ideas um, simultaneously um, I don't uh, you know I don't I don't need this product but I also don't think that they're villains for doing this piece of content as an ad well, your Bay campaign is based around the John Carpenter film they live where you know this happens in the advertisements what other of John Carpenter's films or 80s horror kind of flicks have influenced you over the years or are your favorites in general uh, well, I mean, there's a there's a lot of different. I'm, I, I love I love movies, but um, I mean, John Carpenter's They Live was uh, you know a very very specific concept, which I thought was was super smart. I mean, I I like a lot of his films. I mean, ha Halloween's a, a great great slasher film, but um, you know, pretty much created a genre. But um, but I uh, you know I'm I like a lot of funny but thoughtful movies like Days Confused is one of my all-time favorite movies because I think it uses humor and a, um, and a you know in a, a nostalgic time period as a way of softening the blow of deconstructing the brutality of teenage rites of passage that can be you know very vicious you know um, but everyone goes through it, the awkward phase of being, you know, the freshman who's picked on and then seeing, uh, you know, how you want to emulate people that are older. But, um, you know, I, I like the Coen brothers a lot um, from, you know, their very first 80s film, Blood Simple, you know, uh, on. I, you know, I think they've mostly done really, really great work, but it's, um, you know, it's always smart. So, I, you know, I like stuff that's smart without being pretentious.